Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Let's start with Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Voltaire was a philosopher, and he said he would outlive the publication of the Bible. And the French Bible Society, in their extreme sense of irony, turned his house into a Bible distribution center, which I think is funny. <laughs> you know. But the Bible is something extremely amazing. A book so written so long ago that impacts our world. And I want to talk about it today, and I want to talk about how it developed today. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11 tells us, Therefore let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that none of you will fall through following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of the soul and the spirit, both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is no creature hidden from its sight, his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him whom we have to do. The word of God is alive. It changes you. You can read it different days and, and the Spirit guides you to understand different things different days. And it is a, wor a force in our world. And it is real. And it is true. Cuts like a double-edged sword. Warning Cutright used to say it cuts coming and a going. <laughs> Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And from the childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. This text says, when it says, all scripture is inspired. The, the word there is pneuma. It's God breathed. These words are the breath of God in our world. And in our world, people criticize them. And in our world, people discount them. But this book came about in our world and has changed it. Still to this day, it's the most printed book in the world. In fact, it's probably the top three different versions. This book has changed lives. We're going to look a bit, a little bit today about how this book developed. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. Love never fails. If there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will see. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away with. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. From now on, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, ab love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now the first century church, they didn't function off the Bible. The first century church, they didn't look up the Bible to see how to conduct worship, how to preach the gospel. The reason is because in the first century church, at the beginning of the first century church, the Bible didn't exist. So God had had the apostles put Different people in the church with different gifts. Some had the gift of prophecy. Some had the gift of tongues. But the prophecy said that there would be a day when those gifts would cease. He says, 
I know, verse 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the part will be done away with. So, so God, at first, the church was conducted through these different individuals giving, given special gifts by the laying of the hands of the apostles to know what God wanted. But God was building something. Now, if you look at this bar graph on the bottom, it says we know in part. Now, what was happening was, is God was giving knowledge to the church. And as God was giving knowledge to the church, they were writing that knowledge down. And they were copying it and they were sharing it to the other churches, but they didn't have a completed work yet. So he says, I know in part and I prophesy in part. So, so th there was some knowledge given, but not all the knowledge was accumulated. Let's go to the next slide and, and turn to Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nympha and the church that is in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you and your part, read my letter that is coming to Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed of your ministry, which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be to you. So there was this process going. So, so God was giving them knowledge. They were taking that knowledge. They were writing it down. And here in this letter to the Colossians, we see this process happening. He said, take my letter, make a copy, and give it to the church at Laodicea. Now go to Laodicea, take my letter that I've given to them, and make a copy and give it and have it at your congregation read. So we see this process happening. When, when they were getting inspired texts by God, they were making copies of it and keeping it in the churches. And more and more letters were being copied. And more and more epistles, that is letters, being copied. More and more gospels were being copied. And, and what was developing in these congregations was a library. So each one of these churches had these libraries of letters that were inspired. Well, the prophecy in Corinthians says, I know in part and I prophesy in part. So as these letters of inspired text were being copied and these libraries were developing in these churches, the knowledge was increasing. But there was a time the prophecy said would, when the complete would happen. I know in part and I prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, that which is part shall be done away with. Knowledge was going to be completed. And the time of miraculous gifts was going to end as far as the, the specific gifts given to the churches for, for conducting the church service. The people, individuals in the church that had divine revelation to conduct the worship. It was going to be replaced by that which is complete, that which is perfect. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, I thought that there was another one. <laughs> but, but, so, so, I know in part, I prophesy in part. So as that knowledge was completed, that knowledge on that one graph was completed, the, the prophecy part would get smaller. And the prophecy said that the prediction in 1 Corinthians 13 said that when that which is perfect has come, that which in part shall be done away with. Now, if you look in this, uh, this graph, and we don't have the exact dates when the Bible, different books in the Bible were written, uh, and there's all kinds of predictions of which ones are older and which, th this graph here shows that John was written around 90 AD. So, we had all these libraries in individual churches that developed. So each church, when they, when they got an inspired text from the apostle, they would write it down, they would copy it, they would give it to all the churches, and the, each church had a different library of inspired texts. And then around 90 AD, that library was completed. That prediction, Corinthians said that when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away with. Now you might be asking, if you're thinking about the scripture we read in uh, Colossians, you're asking, well, we're... Where's the letter to the church at Laodicea? <laughs> you know, it says copy it and put it, but, 
You know, God is a good editor, <laughs> you know. When, when you think of being Almighty God, you, you think of this idea that he could put whichever, whatever he wants in his book and not put whatever he wants in his book and through his providence get a perfect book, a perfect New Testament, a perfect Bible. So around 90 AD, the Bible was con- completed. Let's go to that next slide. So there, there are a lot of different people will tell you, and, and you'll be reading, and sometimes in like uh, A&E and the History Channel, they'll say, lost books of the Bible. And you're like, man, they lost some of them. <laughs> you would have thought they'd been more careful. <laughs> you know? So we have the books that we have are, are part of the canon. The canon are the books that we consider inspired. Now, if, if you look at my office or anywhere around me, you will see paper everywhere. I literally write a lot. <laughs> I, I am sure the bill for copying and everything has went way up since I've become preacher. Preachers have written a lot throughout all the ages, and there are all kinds of things that believers in Christ have written. Now, some of these believers are honest, and some of them aren't. There's a word I want to expose you to. It's called pseudepigrapha. Pseudepigrapha is false signature. So if someone comes up to you and says, have you read the Gospel of Thomas? Going, I didn't even know there was a Gospel of Thomas. That has to be one of those that they lost. Now, it's not like they didn't know about the Gospel of Thomas. It's been around forever. The thing is, it's a false signature. It, it, it's not written in the language it would be written if Thomas wrote it. And it was never accepted by the, the, the majority of the believers as part of the canon. But when I say false signature, what I mean is if I sign something Doug Graham, nobody's probably going to read it. I can prove this. I've written two books. How many of you knew I wrote no. <laughs> But But... If I sign it, Doug Graham, nobody's going to read it. But if I sign it, Billy Graham, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that would be what we would call pseudepigrapha. Billy Graham means that I would lie and say Billy wrote it when I wrote it. Well, that's been a, a thing that's happened throughout history. There's a book of Enoch. There's a book of Thomas. There, there are people that did false, right, false signatures. And, and there have always been people follow other people. But if you take our canon, the, the books of the New Testament we have, and uh, there was a, a guy, Athen- Athenaeus, he was an elder at the church in Alexandria, Egypt, in 207, uh, uh, it, was, it was written around 200, it was written in 367 AD, it was um, written about 277 years after John. So John was written in 90 A.D., and Patty's doing the math, and it could be right, and it could be not. But I was thinking about that. I was thinking about Imogene and some of our older members. That would be about four Imogenes, right, Patty? (laughs) So, you know, it seems like a long time. 277 years seems like a long time, but as you get older, it really doesn't seem, you know, as long as you... But if we look at... Athenaeus, as he wrote this letter, just like all preachers write a lot of letters, he wrote the books of the Bible, and it's exactly the same as the books of the Bible we have in his uh, 39th Vestal letter. In other words, the canon of Scripture we have is the same he had in Alexandria, Egypt, a long, 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 long time ago. Now, now, when you think of God Almighty, you think God can do things that we can't do. He spoke the world into existence. Cre- writing a book really isn't that difficult. And keeping that book safe really isn't that difficult. And bringing that book to us compared to speaking the world into existence isn't that difficult. And, and when we look... At all the miracles, this is a miracle. It's a wonderful, amazing thing that they wrote something so long ago in 90 AD. It was completed and we have the same same thing here today. That's incredible. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, some people will tell you. Didn't I'll say Roman church or didn't the Catholic Church write the Bible? 
Didn't the, Catholic, didn't the Bible come from the Catholic Church? Didn't they decide what was in the canon and what wasn't in the canon? I want to show you something in this illustration. I'm sure when Patty was proofing the PowerPoint last night, this really looked interesting to her. But, <laughs> but what, the way the church was set up in the beginning, in, in the church, each church was separate. Each church had their own plurality of elders. So each church had their own elders, and those elders ruled the church. And, and, and led the church and shepherded the church. And they weren't hooked together except for the one king, Jesus Christ. Let's go to the next slide. And then things changed a little bit. So after, after that, that they, the church began with a group, a plurality of elders that were equal in each church leading the church. But it changed just a little bit. And they started having one bishop in each church being over the other elders is more important than the other elders. And then let's go to the next slide. Then what they decided is they would have a metropolitan, and that bishop in that major city would be all over all the churches in that area. And, and, so the, and they became patriarchs, and the patriarchs were over huge swaths of land. So all the churches looked towards the patriarchs for leadership. So th this is an innovation. The, the original church, the, the, the original pattern for the church was a church where elders over each individual congregation led that congregation. But that changed a little bit. Then one of those elders was over the other elders. Then it changed a little bit more. Then one patriarch or metropolitan was over churches in a huge region. And then it got to where there were two very powerful patriarchs. We'll go to the next slide. And in 1054, there were two patriarchs that were over most believers in Christ, most churches in the world. There was Leo the Ninth and Michael Salarius. Now, Leo the Ninth was in Rome, and he was over what they called the Western Church. And, and Michael Salarius was over the Orthodox Church out of Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, Turkey. So they were, they were the two most powerful people, and, and, Things had got concentrated away from the original pattern of simple people, simple group of elders. It got so concentrated that there were two people over most of religious people of that day. And in 1054, they excommunicated each other. The, the bishop at Rome said, I'm over everybody and you're not. I'm over you. And the bishop at Constantinople said, oh, no, <laughs> I'm over everybody. I'm over you, too. And in 1054, they had what's called the Great Schism. 1054 would be the birthday for the Catholic Roman Church. That's where it began, 1054. Now let's go to the, the next slide. So people imagine things a little different than they were. The majority, if we, we, we look back... We look back at Athenaris in 367, and we realize he had this canon that we have the same, 27 books, no apocrypha in the New Testament. But they did get together and talk about these things, and I think that's reasonable that believers would get together and talk about it. And if, if some churches are being affected by Gnostic Gospels like Thomas that have a, were pseudepigrapha that were, had a false signature, they might get together and talk about it. So there were... Different meetings, 325, they had one in Trent, in Nicaea, they had one in Constantinople in 381 A.D., they had one in Ephesus at 431, 449 A.D., they had one in Hippo, 393, 394, 426 A.D. in Algeria. The thing I would point out about all these major councils that did discuss the canon, did discuss some of these books that were Gnostic, they were all in the eastern side. If you're, if you were saying whether the, the, the Roman church gave us the Bible, if you look at all these councils, Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, Hippo, they were all on the Eastern influence side of the map. Not the Western, not the Roman. So, so it would be inconsistent to say the Bible came from the, the Roman church because the, the, even when they got together to discuss these things, it all happened on the Eastern side. Let's go to the next slide. When you see God's hand writing the Bible, and, and remember, the, Bi the, the, the Bible is 
living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide the bone and the marrow. God is, it's his breath coming in and putting the Bible into this world. We have what, where they took all these libraries and they made one book. Now, in a lot of the history of our world, it was very hard to find the Bible. The first time they put it all in and it was major, was published and put around and a lot of people had was the Vulgate in 382. But the Bible existed in these libraries and all these churches with these libraries of inspired texts. And they decided they, they needed to put them all, all the Greek texts. The Bible was, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. So they took all these texts and they compiled them together in, in, uh, 1512 and they created the Textus Receptus. So all the inspired texts were put in this one Greek version that was Koine Greek, the, the language in the New Testament, the language it was written in. And that happened in 1512. Now, sometimes you might wonder, well, there's New International Version, there's New American Standard Version, there's New King James Version, and there's King James Version. King James Version is based on the Textus Receptus in 1512 A.D., the Westcott Hort came around in 1881. And what, what happened was they found these older texts that they did, those, these older copies of these letters from different libraries of different churches that they didn't have that, 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 uh, Erasmus, I guess I didn't put his name on there. Poor guy didn't get any credit. Erasmus <laughs> put, put the Texas Receptus together. And, uh, Erasmus, when he put the Texas Receptus together in 1512, he didn't have access to these older texts. So Westcott and Hort decided to make another compilation. So they made the Westcott-Hort compilation in 1881, and that's what modern versions are based on. Uh, New American Standard, NIV, those texts. So go, go to the next slide. Sometimes, now... Think, think about 90 A.D. to now. Now, you're a scribe. You're, you're a scribe at Bible times, and you're copying things. Now, now you're copying on a scroll, because if you're a Bible person, you call a book a codex. Uh, that, that's the word for book. So the codex hadn't come around yet. So you're writing a scroll, and you're, you're copying everything word for word. And if you must get, make a mistake, guess what they make you do? Start over. There was no whiteout. I guess there's no whiteout today, is there? <laughs> I don't even know if you can buy whiteout. But, but you had to start over. Think about going from 90 AD for things being hand copied down to the first printing presses. And isn't it incredible how accurate things were? Now you might in, in some, ver in some, times there are some minor details that are different. In fact, we came upon one in Sunday school uh, just uh, what, two weeks ago. Uh, the, uh, one version said uh, uh, 50,990 and one said 90. But the thing about it is if you take all the discrepancies between the different, different inspired texts that we have, they amount to less than a page and they're insignificant like 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 some version that this one i think here is it it says the one text will say prayer and fasting and the other will just say prayer but in the another gospel it does say prayer and fasting so it left fasting out there's very little difference between the text i want to explain what the bible is the bible contains history but it's not a history book the Bible contains science, but it's not a science book. The Bible is the story of the gospel. The story of the Messiah promised to come to the world. The story of the Messiah coming to the world, becoming incarnate. And the Bible is what God put in our world so that we can know his truth. And if you think about hand copying a book from 90 AD to now, it is incredible. That the book is the same. It, it is incredible that we can. Obviously, did my notes wrong. <laughs> it is incredible that we can look at 
these different books if, and see the same, that, that, that it's the same over thousands of years. God did something incredible that couldn't happen again. Let, let's go to the next slide. This is the Codex Sinicus. It was put together in 325 A.D. This Bible looks almost exactly like the Bible you have, except for it's, it's obviously in Greek. <laughs> <laughs> but is that incredible? The same books. It, it does have the Apocrypha in it. I should point out the Apocrypha... The word apocrypha mean, means it hidden. It's never been accepted as inspired. Most of you have study notes in your Bibles. It's kind of like the study notes that told the history of, of the Jewish land in, in between time. Uh, but no, no, but the Jewish people never accepted the apocrypha as inspired. Uh, and I, I, I don't even even religious groups that put the apocrypha in Bibles don't accept it as inspired. But this Codex Sinicus from 325 A.D. is the same book you have. You know, I, I really think Westcott and Hort, when they decided to go back and look at the work of Erasmus, that it happened so much earlier in, in, in 1512, I, I really think they probably expected to find a lot of major differences. I really think they probably expected to find controversy and things that were shattering and things that would change our understanding of God or the gospel. The, the amazing thing is, in 1881, when they went back and they worked, looked at the work of Erasmus in 1512, they found that pretty much everything was the same. Except for some minor words, some minor things. And that is impossible without God. Have you ever played the telephone game? I've never had the telephone game fail me. I've always, I've lined kids up and, and I've told them, you know, tell, I don't know if you know what the telephone game is. The telephone game is you line kids up on one side and you say to one kid one word and you, they whisper it and it goes down the line. At the end, they, they, you ask them what they said. In my 30 years of preaching, it has never been the same word. 30 years, ever. It's never, ever been the same word. So, so if you think in 90 AD, they complete the Bible and, and then, you, you get back and you go through and in 1881, Westcott and Hoare puts it together and, and they, you know, you, you get it through and it gets to 2023 and I go to Walmart and I buy me a Bible and I open it up and it's the same as this Bible they would have had in 90 AD. Isn't that incredible? Did that happen by accident? It was God's hand in our world. In our world that is so broken, there is something true. In our world that is so broken, there is something that is God-breathed and inspired and inherent. And as we look at this powerful thing that we hold in our hands that we take completely for granted, I want you to understand that it is real. Because that couldn't happen by accident. You, you couldn't. You couldn't have that happen by accident. You couldn't start with something in different parts of the world. I mean, we're, we're talking about Alexandria is in Africa. Constantinople is in Turkey. And as we look at all these Bibles that, that went across generations and thousands of years, and we come down to 2023 and we have a Bible that is the same, that's remarkable. I want you to understand the Bible is true. Inspired, authoritative, and is good for every good work. Let's look at First Peter chapter one, verse twenty-two. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another for the from the heart. For you have born again, not of seed which is perishable but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, all the glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which has been preached to you. 
You know what Peter was telling you? <coughs> You've been born again by word. And he says that word, that word of God is going to endure forever. And when Voltaire said he was going to outlive the word, he was wrong. And they produced Bibles in his house. The word of God is still here. The word of God is still sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is still alive. It is active. And it can change you if you open your heart to it. If you come to the point that you believe Jesus is the Christ and you're ready to confess that before men, repent of your sins and be baptized for remission of your sins. Come forward as we stand and sing.